My name is Sophie Lang. Welcome to Tank Fest 2019. We are here to film my top tanks for the Tank Museum. They've asked me to pick five. It's a tremendously difficult choice, but I wanted to pick some of the ones that gave me the best impression, helped me learn, and helped to foster my interest in armored history. So, we'll give it a start. So this is my number five. This is the Churchill Crocodile. Now this actual vehicle was never designed. This isn't a real crocodile. This was the last Churchill 7 to roll off the line at Vauxhall. But it's in awesome condition and it's been mocked up really well as an example of the crocodile. So one of the reasons that makes this one of my favorites is it's innovative and it's really scary. So you can see in the front and not only is the frontal armor of this vehicle is mad thick to take any punishment it might need from the front, there's a nozzle here used for this, as a flamethrower, and so this could throw a liquid fuel, sort of essentially a napalm, about 150 yards. And so in, inside there's controls for first to the wet shot where it, shows, it throws only the liquid, and then that gives people a little bit of time to surrender or to leave because the second shot's gonna be hot, and that'll light people up from afar. So these often worked in combination with the AVREs, throw a mortar, crack open a bunker, throw the liquid, and if the flame doesn't even get on the inside of the bunker, the oxygen is taken up by the fire so quickly that the insides will suffocate. So it's so terrifying that it caused crews to surrender just as soon as the liquid arrives. And so in sort of a backward way, it sort of saved lives and until it didn't. So the Churchill Crocodile crews were essentially treated as commandos and were often shot upon capture, but a very, very powerful thing. One of the things that is interesting about this particular vehicle is a lot of the like American flamethrower vehicles, for example, armored vehicles, did not retain their main cannon, but this one kept it. Something that's also a curious thing about the British designs is all their flamethrower vehicles were named after reptiles. We have a crocodile, we had a salamander, we had an adder, and so this is just another example of that. The UK SPGs are often named with religious titles or bishop or priest and things like that. So it's very, very unique, and that's why I wanted to show it off. Awesome, so we're out here at the arena in Tankfest, and I'm going to show you my number four. This is on a lot of lists for really good reasons, but I picked mine because it's an awesome example, I think, of teamwork, and how thinking together and thinking differently can provide the exact solution. This is the M4A4 Sherman Firefly, and this is, we have a British gun, powerful 17-pounder on the reliable American hull. This particular tank comes from Belgium, and I think it was in Canadian hands when it was found, and so they've restored it to beautiful condition. And so here, a perfect example of how you can tell a firefly is the applique armor placed over the positions. And the co-driver there, they needed extra room for ammunition. Another way that you can tell is they needed some space for the engine. The M4A4 carried the A57 multibank engine. That's five inline sixes put together to get the power they needed for a tank. So they needed to make the hull a little bit longer. And you can see the space in between the suspension bogies. That's an M4A4. So you can see this thing from afar, and it's awesome, highly effective. It was exactly what they needed, and it took some minds to think a little bit different. And I think that's really cool, and it's awesome to see one in running condition here at Tank Fest. I can't wait to hear them fire this thing up and get it rolling. This is my number three, the Stridswagen 103, and this is the world's most unique main battle tank. That's right, it's a main battle tank. Not a tank destroyer, not an assault gun, but a main battle tank. Why? Because of its functionality. Not the way that it looks, but the way that it works. And designed in accordance with the defensive doctrine of Sweden at the time, it's built to defend the country against the uh, assumed impending Soviet Union Serb force. Um, and so it's built for crew protection, mobility, and a laser accurate gun. So in a tank duel, Four out of five times, the one that fires first is going to be the winner. And so this one is designed with laser precision. Some of the top fire control systems at the time was what this was designed for. So to be able to slow and to turn down the numbers of the Soviet Union to give the Allies time to respond in the case of a Soviet Union offensive. So this is one of the coolest ones. This is the most unique design. You can see from behind me, the Bofors gun here, 105 millimeters Bofors gun, is entirely fixed, which means that the tank has to turn and it's fitted with a hydropneumatic suspension with a 22 degree gun elevation or depression. So in order to position the gun in accordance with the Sweden terrain, which can vary from like jagged fjords to rolling hills, it can the, you adjust the tank itself to be able to find, to find your target and to fire. The commander's position rotates independently of the hull, which gives a great view of the battlefield, and he can assume controls for the gunner as well. It has the radio, uh, the radio operator can assume the controls of the driver and take that tank out of there after it fires. Shoot and scoot as they say. So this is one of the things that's super cool about this vehicle is the slat armor in the front designed to disable the heat or shaped charge, shaped, shaped charge projectiles, as well as over here, 
18 jerry cans on the side provides further protection against the shape charge projectiles as well as almost another 400 liters of fuel. So it's designed to be able to protect the crew and take down the targets and get out of there for the next, for the next event. This is one of the cooler tanks that I've ever seen and so that's why it hits my top three. Welcome to my number two. This is the M103A2. This is a tank that I got to see in the flesh for the first time here at the museum at last year's Tank Fest. And this is a tank that, take a look, you can't forget it. This is the tallest tank here in the arena. And it became one of my favorites in really short order. So outside of the size, upwards of 60 tons, you can see a rifled 120 and Ma Deuce up top. This was a breakthrough tank. This is the last of the American heavy tanks. At the end of World War II, we had a prototype heavy lineup to respond to the German Tiger II and then the Soviet IS-3. And then we sort of lost track of the program, but it came back around when Korea threatened to go global and the Soviets came out with the IS-8 or the T-10. We realized we again needed a heavy tank and we responded with uh, the prototype before this one, the A-43, ended up with this. And then through some upgrades, the M the M103A2, it showed up with a better engine. Not a bigger engine by displacement, but it was more efficient along with the powertrain to extend the range of the tank from about 80 miles to about 200 to 300. And you can see one of the features of this tank that's really distinct is the shape of the hull. The sort of elliptical shape, not only on the front, but also on the sides. Built for better ballistic protection with the curve, but also instead of making thicker armor, straight armor to protect against the same rounds, you save, you save weight, uh, which you also save in fuel and you save space. So it's a very efficient design in, in terms of defense as well as an offense. The 120 has an extreme range, 2,000, 3,000 meters with accuracy. It was a powerful gun and the crews really dug it. You can see the range finder up top, the little frog's eyes looking things. And this, uh, the M60A2 was used by the Marine Corps. Sort of by the end of the, uh, the M102, or the M103 development, by the end of the M103 development, the Army decided they didn't need it for its functions, but the Marines did. So they take to it. And this was used by the Marines um, about into the, into the 1970s. So this is one of the only ones that you're gonna see, not only here in the UK, but here in Europe. We have some back home in, in the US, but this is a really, really special vehicle. And it's really awesome to see it in motion here at the event. Can't forget it. The size of this thing, the size of the turret, the size it will bustle out back. It's not just for extra space in the turret, but also as a counterweight for the gun, ammunition storage, supply storage. And the bustle on this one was so big, they had to put a deflector for the heat from the engine exhaust in the back to keep it from overheating. The commander sits at the very back, his own spot, and right and behind there, where the 50 cal is, the turret is so large, I used to say you could probably fit a hammock in it, but <laughs> it's an awesome machine. And seeing it here is like, it's like nothing else to see it in motion. So really, really special and it made an impression. Love my M103. It's a fantastic vehicle, so come see it for yourself. That's why it's my number two. And this one is my number one tank because this is the first tank that bit me and gave me the tank bug. So the Panzer IV, the first time I had any sort of interaction with anything like this at all was at a Living History event when I was about eight years old and they had a die cast Panzer IV and I saw it and I needed it and I spent all my lunch money for the week to get it and I've had it ever since. And so one of the other reasons why I picked this as my top tank was you see it from the very beginning of the war as it was added into production in the late 30s. And then you see it all the way through to the end of the war. And it's sort of dubbed the Sherman of the Germans because it was upgradable. It was upgunnable, up armorable, you can see here. With applique armor, it's got the long 75 that made it more and more effective. Originally designed as an infantry support tank with a short barreled 75 to be able to take out machine gun nests and bunkers and provide infantry support. Not necessarily thought of as tank versus tank, alongside the Panzer III, which was supposed to be engaging tanks itself. So, the war went on and they found out they needed a little bit more power to deal more with tanks. They came into more tanks than they thought they might. So you see a, a bigger gun, you get to see more armor here on the front, there on the sides. And you can tell this one's being more of an early production vehicle by the radio position here with the machine gun being further set back than here with the gunner's position. And you can see it's up armored here and over on the sides. The hatches, there used to be hatches on the sides there and they're covered by the armor. And so this thing became more effective. It was upgradable, more uh, updatable, adaptable. And so it remained effective in through the end of the war against its adversaries. And so it takes a little bit less, um, less sun than it's bigger, more armored. The Tiger II and the Tiger, it's got a little, a little less, it's a little less intimidating, but still very effective. And so I think that earns it its top place for me. 
Thank you for checking out my top five. I hope you dig these big beasts as much as I do. Subscribe to the Tank Museum's YouTube channel for more awesome armored content and, and support them on their Patreon so they can do more of what they do best, which is bringing the education, bringing the beasts to you. You can check me out on my own YouTube channel or on Twitch for live tank event coverage, armored vehicle chats, and World of Tanks gameplay. And I'll see you guys around next time. Come on out for Tank Fest or Tiger Day and see it for yourself. I'll see you soon.